put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Star Trek Voyager Show Review Within the pilot, our crew become trapped in the Delta Quadrant, 70,000 light years away from home in the Alpha Quadrant. And they are in uncharted space and will of course have to do the Star Trek Federation mission of exploring new life and phenomena, planets and the like and much like in the original series they really are far away and there is no checking back in and they are the only space the only federation ship out there as, as far as they know at least and the crew is put together of both starfleet and maquis people now if you haven't watched Deep Space Nine before you watch this and they were you know this I believe this started airing two years after Deep Space Nine aired and Deep Space Nine explains the Maquis this one we get a text crawl at the beginning which briefly mentions it mentions the Kardashians and the Maquis, Maquis without explaining particularly who the Kardashians are so Briefly, for those who are considering watching this and haven't watched Deep Space Nine yet, the Cardassians are a you know colonialist people, and they had colonized the planet of Bajor. But now, when you know, in the time of Voyager and Deep Space Nine, Cardassia has left Bajor mostly, and are now working with the Federation. And not everybody on Bajor is happy with that, and some of them formed the Maquis to fight the Kardashians, particularly those in the DMZ. And it is... the group is... the, the Maquis are not only made up of Bajorans, but also just other species who are sympathetic to, or members of other species, who are sympathetic to the Maquis cause. Now, these two groups will have to work together, and it's, it's an uneasy alliance and a volatile situation. But it's the best chance that either of them have for getting home. Now, I realize a lot of people hate this show. I personally found it to be deeply compelling. You know, not, not perfect, but deeply compelling. And the Maquis are not quite the Federation have rules and strict discipline. The Maquis are not quite that. They're a bit more of, you know, they're were, they were freedom fighters, are freedom fighters. So they are a bit more loose with it. You know, pretty much everyone could join the Maquis. And it doesn't help that Voyager, the Federation starship, was sent to capture the Maquis that they end up with, both of them trapped in the Delta Quadrant. Now, the among the issues that the Maquis have with the Federation are, as already mentioned, the Federation's willingness to work with former enemies, 
you know, this and Deep Space Nine kind of poke at this idea, this utopian idea of the Star Trek future, which is very present in both the original series and the next generation. Deep Space Nine more so than this one. The focus of this is not quite the same as Deep Space Nine. And, yeah, the, the Maquis do not have Starfleet training. The... And, and we indeed have, like Deep Space Nine, several main characters, a few main characters who do not have military training. Now, there is baggage from the Maquis, as already hints that the, there was not a lot of discipline, and some of them are violent. They were a group specifically made to fight the Kardashians. Now, the conflict is often this living up to Federation principles versus improving their own situation. And this, you know, if they were to give some of their technology, which much of which is completely unheard of in the Delta Quadrant, or at the very least not very common, which, you know, where the Federation is plentiful, you know, they, they give out their technology to anyone who's a member share their technology and here you know giving some of their technology to others in the quadrant those indigenous to the quadrant could severely alter the balance of power and yeah that most definitely goes against federation principles now before i go too much further in this review i should note that it is co-written by my ex-fiance who has spent far more time on Star Trek than I have. Now, as already hinted at, the they will meet new life forms, explore new planets, technology, and various phenomena out in space. And as, as in other Star Trek, and as in other Star Trek, they will have to really understand some of this in order to solve the conflict of the episode or the group of episodes. The show challenges norms and explores different themes and ideas, various political, philosophical ideas and really has some compelling ethical dilemmas, as the best of Trek often does. Now, they are in in the Dungeon Quadrant without any, they start out with their, without any allies, and they are not a battleship. Among the enemies they will encounter are the Kazon sects, these gangs that fight each other for resources. And some of the conflicts, armed conflicts particular, that Voyager gets into will give them a bad reputation because no matter how peaceful Voyager had tried to be in the conflict, the word that spreads is that there's this new ship and it was in a fight with species X and the other people in the quadrant already know species X they don't know Voyager they've never heard of the Federation so in their minds it's just this new group came in and yeah got in a fight so that's also something they will have to deal with. Now, the, there's the issue of whether the Maquis members are quite trustworthy and they're very much used to their independence. And the, in general, 
this, you know, our main cast is not the conflict and story killing harmony of the next generation. There is inherent conflict just in the main group. Now, and there may be a real threat of mutiny by the Maquis members. Now, and that of course brings up anytime you you have fiction that focuses on military and works within sort of the hierarchy and you know a, a mostly functioning military you have to decide between how much it's going to be that everyone follows orders that you know, if w whether or not everyone gets along, whether or not everyone fully respects their, you know, the officers higher up than themselves and the like, versus, you know, how much conflict there can be within the main cast, or whether the conflict always arises from the outside, in which case there's not necessarily a need for that many characters if all of them get along in the main cast. And that, again, is where this and Deep Space Nine fare a lot better than The Next Generation. As in the Deep Space Nine review, I have to say, The Next Generation is still a great show. It's just this gets some things right that that didn't. Now... As with the original series and The Next Generation, you don't have to know Star Trek in order to follow this. You can go in blind, and over the course of several episodes, you'll piece together what does this and that technology on the ship do, who are these characters, and how do they relate to each other. Now, it's a small ship making it more personal, even intimate, with just, I believe there are roughly 150 members on the ship, so the, yeah, everyone knows each other, and they are going to run into each other over and over, so the people who get along can spend a lot of time together, the people who don't are going to be butting heads a, a lot. And in general, the, the show is not the, you know, it has consequences. It's not the solution and reset that was sometimes the case in The Next Generation. Now, like the other shows, the ship here has a function that the others do not. It can land. It doesn't have to remain in orbit of, you know, a planet. Now, and character relationships, including romances, are very credibly done with, you know, chemistry. The progression is very believable, and we see various states along the way in relationships that may well develop over the course of the entire show. Now, this explores the, you know, the situation here of suddenly being far away from home and not, not able to return for the foreseeable future. And a mission might take, you know, weeks, months, years, but here there's genuinely, some of the members might, like, be, you know, some of them might die of old age if they don't cut significant, a significant chunk out of the trip home, you know, and certainly everyone will be very, very old. Any survivors will be very, very old. Now, this is sometimes preachy, and we do sometimes, like in Deep Space Nine, get open endings with where, where it favors 
increasing tension over the course of the episode leading to a great climax and we kind of extrapolate from there what you know how the conflict is resolved with you know yeah the episode may end without us seeing the full resolution but we can tell you know it's on the right path we can we have an idea of how it will be resolved now we get some really cool and fun science fiction concepts in this heck we start with an alien alien abduction now this has strong female characters again that's the best star trek does they and and without them losing their you know they're still sexy they're still feminine now the show does repeat itself a, a bit with you know and thus renders less special because of overexposure certain concepts plots you know guest characters guest species planets you know tactics and the like now getting into the focus of all great star trek the characters themselves our captain is Janeway and she is highly competent as a captain but with having to be a captain for so long again without any you know time in between missions she will have to go to you know she really has to focus also on you know imbuing hope in her crew and keeping spirits high she's very much a human being she is a bit of a scientist she grew up loving math she seeks out explanations similar to Captain Picard she's relatable fun the the crew can actually spend off time with her and it's you know at, at one point she says there's you know one rule of going to the holiday with me is you leave your rank at the door so yeah and she is a badass in the vein of Kirk, Riker, and Cisco you know she gets one-liners she goes on away missions now her first officer is Chakotay who is a Native American and that culture and those kind of you know he has some abilities within that and that is explored the he was Maquis and he was made first officer in order to give the Maquis a position of power making it less likely that they would mutiny but he did also earn that position before he he left Starfleet in order to be a maquis. Now he used to be violent, but once he joins the Voyager crew, he becomes a bit more pacifist. He can be very disarming with enemies. Now he does advise Janeway, but if if she didn't already agree with what he's saying, she's not necessarily going to take his advice. And this may have been that the writers were worried that this first female captain would be, you know, that the show would be seen as sexist if her male first officer was questioning every, every decision she was making. And this does ultimately lead to, or it might be what led to Chakotay not being as compelling of a character as he could be. They, they may not really have known what to do with him. Now, the second officer is Tuvok, a full Vulcan. 
and he is the character who has known and been faithful first officer to the captain for years. Well, actually, not all of them have been first officer for years anyway. He is the Bones slash Spock and Dax of the show. The Next Generation didn't particularly have a character like that. Now, once, you know, Chakotay was made first officer instead of Tuvok, you know, he he's going to second guess a lot. And Chakotay, Tuvok had infiltrated Chakotay's Maquis group in, you know, that's part of how they managed to catch the, the Maquis. And that, you know, leads to a lot of trust issues with, you know, Chakotay was fighting alongside Tuvok, and he truly trusted him, as you have to, fighting alongside others in battles, and then he finds out that all along Tuvok was Starfleet, and yeah, so their relationship is a bit strained because of that. Now, as mentioned, he is a full Vulcan, which means we get a full Vulcan security officer where we have also had a Klingon and a shapeshifter and while the shapeshifter wasn't physically strong he had physical abilities and otherwise yeah these are physically strong they're very in control of their emotions and they're very determined to uphold the you know to, to keep fairness keep you know, ensure justice, making them ideal as security officers. Now, he, his logic can sometimes be flexible, and he might go against orders if it seems the more reasonable course of action. And at at the same time, his logic is sometimes too rigid and he may make some mistakes because of that. He finds ways to express, verbally express emotion without breaking the Vulcan stoicism. At one point he's asked if he misses his children and he he says that his children are part of his identity and he is incomplete without them. Now, he does not have a lot of friends on the ship, and with a Vulcan we get the return of neck pinches and mind metals and such, and new things are done with them. And from, like, interviews and even some script input, it's clear that the actor really got the character. Now, Voyager is not going to have just any Tom, Doc, and Harry on its crew. So, you know, what it does have is Tom Paris, the con officer, Doctor, Doctor, and the operations officer, Harry Kim. Now, taking them in order, Tom is a gifted pilot. He's the son of an admiral whose name and expectations he has trouble living up to. The captain gives him another chance to prove himself and certainly being in the Delta Quadrant gives him a second chance to define his identity over time and you know him and other characters are given that chance and they may just take it and will follow as they, you know, follow their progression towards a different identity. Now, the he's one of the characters who has made some choices that he may regret or that was very painful and, 
you know, he he tries to do better now. He is not apologetic about it, which is good because characters who brood over their past can be very dull and annoying. You know, dull in the sense of not much happens to them, they're not particular dynamic, they're just brooding and annoying in that we really want them to stop obsessing over something they did and can't change. We want them to, to, to do new things, we want to see them in new situations and how they handle themselves there. Now, he is very much a ladies man in the vein of Kirk and Riker. He made a fatal pilot's error that got three people killed and he lied about it at first, but then he confessed, which he says was a huge mistake. Now, he was Maquis for just weeks, not very long, and he was captured on the very first mission with them and sent to a penal colony. He is a troublemaker and he is not good at settling down. Now, he, he misses Earth and Earth culture and gets very into Earth culture, especially before his time, like cars from, you know, a few decades before, excuse me, now, you know, and like jukebox TV sets and such. Now, he is one of the characters who are young and has some weakness, and he'll make mistakes which, you know, he, the rest of the crew, and we can learn from. The doctor, also known as the emergency medical hologram, as a hologram, he's, he has a mind of his own, he's self-aware, and as a hologram he can make himself be solid so he can physically interact with things, and he can, you know, make himself not solid. Now, this means that he cannot be harmed physically by any treatment he might have to treat. Say someone comes in with radiation poisoning, he doesn't have to wear a suit to protect himself. Now, he is confined to the sick bay and the holodeck because only they have hollow projectors. Now, he can contact them via the comm channels. He is amazing at medicine and, trust me, he knows. He is very snarky, very funny, and the he is not humble in the least. You know that thing where doctors kind of talk to the patient trying to make them more comfortable? Bedside man. Yeah. His sucks, dude. He was only, or is only, an emergency medical hologram. He is made to assist, supplement the actual doctor, but he now has to be the long-term doctor, which is part of why he is becoming more human. Now, he is full of, his, full of himself, but also deep down insecure when dealing with anything that isn't medicine, because that is all he knows, and while he's excellent at that, he is very inexperienced with other things, such as interpersonal relationships, emotions, and such. Now, he tries to choose a name uh, as he is forging his own identity over the course of the show. He's a doctor, not a blank. And the crew consider him a necessary nuisance. They don't really treat him like a human being considering him just a hologram. Now, he is the non-human character who gives us perspective on humans as an outsider, 
uh, you know, the way Spock, Odo, and Data are of their respective shows. Now, he he hasn't had, you know, he he will have some experiences that he is not ready for, since by you know he's he's a grown man, but he has not spent years before being a grown man, you know, spending them around people, attending schools and such. While he has, you know, the knowledge of such, he hasn't, yeah, he doesn't have experience with it. But, you know, it is his strength that he is the very model of a modern doctor medical with information vegetable, animal, and mineral. Now, moving on to Ensign Harry Kim, the con officer, who thinking about it, I'm not entirely sure he's an ensign, but he is inexperienced, he's fresh out of Starfleet Academy, but he's not necessarily a pushover. He is the youngest senior officer, which means that he's sometimes picked on by the rest of them. He He's one of the few people that really trust Tom. You know, most consider him a coward, but Kim is his friend, and Tom tries to talk him into raunchier behavior, and he's also sort of his mentor, and they affect each other. Kim has horrible luck with women, often falling for ones much more aggressive than he can really deal with, and Tom will give him some advice on it, whether that's wanted or not. He's also terrible at hiding when he's in love. As he puts it, Harry, read me like a book, Kim. Now, the that brings us to Kess. She is Okampan, and she is one of the only Okampans to leave their underground city where they've lived for generations, in part because she's curious. And she has psychic powers, including telepathy, which is normal to her species. Tuvok helps her develop them. She can sometimes detect things that the others can't because of these abilities. Now, while Janeway has, you know, is responsible for everyone, in her crew, she on her crew, she takes special care of Kess because she is the most innocent, and Janeway mentors her. Now she becomes an assistant doctor slash nurse, and she really bonds with the doctor. You know, she can tell that he really he has feelings and. She, you know, oh, and she is two years old, and her species only lived to the age of nine. But yeah, she can tell that the doctor is not just programming, although he, you know, his programming goes to the extent of being willing to give up his life in order to protect and save others. But, yeah, she can tell that he yearns to be more than an automated doctor, you know, as excellent a doctor as he is. He also wants to be a human being outside of being a doctor. It's similar to how Data wanted to be more than an android. Now, he is, his program is adaptive as it, you know, as useful, as would also have been useful in the field of medicine. Right, I was talking about Kess, and then I got back to talking about the Doctor. Can you tell that Kess is not that interesting of a character? Now, the... That brings us to Neelix, who is Talaxian. He is the only guide that they have, but he really knows the Quadrant with, you know, knowledge of species, planets, technology, 
and he he does not have Starfleet training in general, not a military person, similar to Kes. He can be a bit eccentric, and he is a main character who serves as comic relief, but unlike Rom, the frequent guest on Deep Space Nine, he is not incompetent, which Rom was when bullied by his brother Quark. He's not insecure and bumbling, and he, you know, it's like with the Doctor. He can be funny, but he's a full character also, and they do deep, touching drama with him. Speaking purely for myself, when he isn't, like, cheery and happy, when he's serious, you know, unhappy, sad, even angry and tense especially, I take him completely seriously because he's usually so happy. Now, he is in love with Kes and very jealous. It's kind of puppy love. They're both sweet-natured, naive, sometimes even childlike. He is very much an optimist and enthusiastically throws himself into new tasks. He and Kes both chose to stay on the ship, and he, he has a deep-seated need to feel needed by others. He loves to cook for the crew, something they will have to adjust their palates to accommodate, and he, he is great at keeping the spirits high at even the worst of times. He's determined to keep people happy and give them new experiences. The actor acts very well through the makeup. Now, he has been taking care of himself for years. He fell in love with Kess the last two or three years. He was a junk dealer. Meeting the Voyager crew was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. And in part, his positive attitude is because of how stable his life on Voyager is and in part a coping me mechanism with the awful experiences and the hardship taking care of himself has you know in part been it's one of those things where you know you either go just really you know sad and just very yeah brooding or you just say, you know what, I'm going to smile no matter what, and he chose the latter. He and Tuvok are kind of the spot and bones of the show. They needle each other, but deep down there is mutual respect. And this relationship is in part because he is so high emotion, while Tuvok expresses very little emotion at least. Now, Chief Engineer Balana Torres has a human father and a Klingon mother, and she struggles with which culture to belong to. And she's been running from the, you know, yeah, this conflict and her Klingon half her entire life, throwing herself into projects, even battles. And she dropped out of Starfleet Academy in, you know, the second year of it and it's because of her aggression not because of a lack of skill and she she's another member of the Marquis who's made an officer and she once remarks that everyone who cares about her is on the ship now and or everyone she cares about something like that she is she may have joined the Maquis to have a cause and channel her aggressive, you know, tendencies, her Klingon half. She has a sort of brother-sister relationship with Chakotay, who's one of the few people she truly feels comfortable around. Now, the... The show is, let's say, comfortable with showing off 
you know, sexy women, also sometimes men, no homo, and this is thankfully never at the expense of acting talent. They do not give big parts or lines or such to anyone, no matter how sexy, that can't live up to that. But it is, the show is still plenty happy to show them off more so than The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. And you, know, you could argue that the original series is at least as bad as this, given that, you know, the women wore less. The, the you know, miniskirts. It was the 60s. Now, the, and, and this, of course, you know, even as these shows do have you know, you know, they're not wearing a ton and it's kind of tight, you know, fitting, form-fitting clothing. Now, the seasons one through three do have some painful kind of establishing the characters episodes they, you know they, they suffer from that and the you know but once you're past that the show becomes fantastic now some of the main characters and guest characters are seen with power disempowered you know working with an enemy or a former enemy and the like and sometimes characters are taken out of their element you know truly disempowered and that allows the show to really explore them now and everyone's very much a human being you know they, they have humanity or even the humanoids they have humanity now and we have very dynamic characters and character relationships that can also develop off screen. The characters are still there, even if we're not necessarily seeing them now. And the cast are pure chameleons, you know, dealing with you know, very credibly portraying different versions of themselves. You know, given that it's a sci fi show, there are body swaps and the like. We do have some familiar faces and species and such. There are great guest stars, you know, guest actors, including kid actors, children, child actors. Now, the various cultures are explored and developed, and, you know, them and the world. And it, the show uses humor to temper the sad and dramatic episodes and scenes. Now, unlike The Next Generation, the ship is completely on its own in the quadrant with no backup, no checking in, and the ship needs repairs from the get-go. And, you know, they there's no replacing, like, photon torpedoes and the like. So, and, and in general, the Starfleet tech, you know, what they have on the ship may well be all there is in the quadrant. And that makes it closer to the original series than The Next Generation, which did the sequel thing of confusing bigger for better, where this and the original series are more intimate. This is less exhausting, tight and loaded than Deep Space Nine, but it's great in its own way. There's good character continuity and some plot continuity as well, but in the one-offs they do use the fact that they have a completely blank slate very well. They they, they tailor the planet, species, technology, and the like 
to fit that specific episode, what, you know, the, the themes that they want to explore there, including some of, you know, the past, the, the, the Western world's past, and some parts of our past that we may want to forget. Now, season four is excellent through and through. The, the, some of the ongoing species are very compelling, and all but one, we see both, you know, all but one of the, the ones that have more than one episode, we see both where we consider them to be absolutely awful, and we see them in a much more positive light, where we really sympathize with their situation. Now, the ship has bioneural gel packs, which leads to faster processing time. And I figure this is like instinct, where a computer might, you know, try to calculate or, you know, go through a few even quick processes before it does it. Instinct will just immediately, you know, do it, and that can be very useful in, you know, the right circumstances. And the other than the the season one finale and the season five premiere episode, every finale and you know season opener are deeply compelling, including the series finale, which you know, features callbacks and really, you know, gets into the, the various characters and where they are headed in the future. Now, the, the production values are good to great. There are some Philip K. Dick themes of reality versus simulation. You know, how can you tell the difference? And does it matter to tell the difference? And, you know, forming your own identity and what that is, you know, what that consists of. And are you sure you are who you think you are? And where most Star Trek has like at least one light episode every few heavy episodes this one can have a lot of heavy ones in a row and there are some very sad episodes some real tragic ones and while they aren't all equally you know they they aren't all equally tragic but even some of the heaviest ones have often have some light scenes and after some really tragic episodes our crew you know may get a win which they certainly don't always win this covers distinctly different genres you know before an episode starts you do not know the when the what and the how the where you know and the show uses that really well now, to save replicator power, they have a botanical garden which Kess attends to. Now, even after hundreds of episodes and entire other and other entire series of Star Trek, I found that this still had new topics to explore. The show is not always tense, but when it is, then it's very, very tense. And like Deep Space Nine, it seems they learned their lessons from the next generation. It's much more tight and well executed than that. Now, with Neelix cooking, it feels more personal, down to earth, and with such different people, you know, it's kind of like a family. You know, not everyone gets along, but they do work together. Now, on that schmaltzy note, 
Live long and prosper. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise. The links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.